An introduction to nuclear chemistry is going to be the topic of this lesson. Now, most of the entire year of high school chemistry is devoted to the electron cloud. We talk about chemical reactivity and chemical reactions where bonds are being broken and bonds are being formed. Well, bonds are made of electrons, and chemical reactions is just a rearranging of the electrons among the atoms in different ways and stuff like this. Well, this is the one chapter where we're not talking about the electron cloud anymore. We're going to talk about that nucleus on the inside where most of the mass of an atom lies. And it turns out where most of this mass lies is important because in these nuclear reactions, mass is actually being converted into energy. And the energy payload here is typically far greater than anything we're likely to see in a normal chemical reaction. Now this lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, before we get too far into nuclear chemistry here, we've got some new terminology and some nuclear particles we've got to define. Some will be familiar and some will be brand new here. So we'll start off with here. This is the alpha particle with the symbol alpha here. And an alpha particle is the same thing as a helium nucleus. And if we look at our symbols here, so we've got the mass number on top, the atomic number on bottom. The mass number is going to give you the total number of protons and neutrons as a reminder there. And then your atomic number is going to give you the charge on whatever particle we're talking about. Uh, and in this case, typically that is going to correspond to the number of protons. Keep in mind that usually in some sort of nucleus, it's just protons and neutrons. The protons have a plus one charge. The neutrons have no charge. And that's why this number is generally going to correspond to the number of protons protons, either in a nucleus or in a particle, although we'll see some exceptions when we start dealing with these particles. All right, so that's your alpha particle, again, the equivalent of a helium nucleus. Keep in mind, it is not the same thing as a helium atom, because this thing does not have any electrons. A helium atom has a nucleus and electrons. This is just the equivalent of the nucleus of a helium atom. All right, here we've got neutron. Neutron has no charge, but a mass number of one. So your proton here, uh, it's got a charge of plus one and a mass number of one. So, and then here we've got the beta here, and you might also see this written with an E for electron. And it's got a charge of negative one, it's got a mass number of zero. And if you look on your table there, I've given you the exact masses of all these. So, and they're not exactly four, one, one, zero, zero. Well, that one actually is exactly zero, but for the rest of these, it's not exact. So here with the electron, I just want you to realize that it's not actually got a zero mass. Its mass number is zero, which is kind of like rounded to Venera's whole number. So, but the mass of an electron is actually 0 0.00015 AMUs. It's some tiny fraction of an AMU. But the fact that it has a little bit of mass is gonna be important uh, for a generalization we make in just a second. Now this guy's gonna be new as well. This is what we call a positron. It is a, uh, it's analogous to an electron, but with a plus one charge instead of a minus one charge. So it is the antimatter particle that corresponds, uh, the antimatter partner, if you will, that corresponds to the electron. It turns out when you have an electron and a positron and they meet, they annihilate themselves or they annihilate each other and, and release a ton of energy in the process. So, uh, you know, you might get some like comic book kind of antimatter kind of uh, connotations here and stuff like this, but Antimatter really does exist. So, but there's not a whole lot for positrons in our universe, although some are produced by some of the nuclear reactions we're gonna look at or in th thunderstorms and things of this sort. Um, but they don't exist for very long because they're gonna bump into electrons in most cases pretty darn quickly. And again, when a positron and an electron meet, they annihilate each other. They both cease to exist in this universe. All right, last but not least here, we have got a gamma ray. This is the only thing up here that's not a particle. These are all particles. This is a gamma ray. This is the highest energy electromagnetic radiation. You might recall uh, earlier in the course, we talked about electromagnetic radiation. There were gamma rays and then x-rays and then ultraviolet and then visible spectrum and then infrared microwaves and radio waves. Well, these are the highest energy and again, often associated with nuclear radiation. All right, so these, we just gotta have some familiarity because we're gonna bring these up time and time again uh, throughout our discussion here. Now, one thing you should note, if you notice I've organized these in such a way that they have increasing mass as you go up. So notice the neutron is just slightly heavier than a proton. They both round to a whole number of one for the mass number, but the neutron is just slightly heavier. So, and it turns out you're gonna see an, a, a correspondence in the opposite direction that we call penetrating power. So, and you can think of these particles again as size. So think of, uh, think of having like a volleyball net or a tennis net or something like that. And think of trying to throw a volleyball 
through the net. Well, you know, the holes are like yay big and the volleyball is like yay big, so it's not going to happen. But if you make the ball smaller and smaller and smaller, so let's, instead of going volleyball, let's shorten that down to say a softball. Well now, a softball eh, might be able to squeeze through if you throw it hard enough, but still maybe not. Go down to like tennis ball, and now maybe with that volleyball net anyways, that tennis ball might make it through on occasion. And by the time you go all the way down to something like a small marble, now it's got a great likelihood of making it through that net. When we talk about penetrating power, we're talking about you know these different particles or rays, their ability to, to pass through uh, uh, a layer of atoms of some sort. Now, atoms are made of mostly empty space. You've got a nucleus in the center that's pretty small, but uh, where all the mass is concentrated. And then you've got this electron cloud with these little tiny electrons in various places, but most of that atom is made up of empty space. And when you've got like a sheet of metal or something like that, there's lots of gaps in there if you're small enough to fit through. And here we see that our gamma rays are the most likely type of radiation to make it through. And then your alpha particles are the least likely to make it through due to their size. And so we talk about the smaller the particle or rays, the more penetrating power it has. If you want to put up a shield for say nuclear radiation, that shield is typically going to have to be much, much, much thicker to protect against gamma rays than to protect against alpha particles. So if I, you know, if I had to choose to be hit with a certain type of radiation from the outside, I'll pick the alpha particles. So because that's least likely to actually penetrate through my skin and start causing me, you know, major damage to my internal organs and stuff like this. However, on the other hand, it turns out if you, uh, you know, swallow some poison that gives off alpha particles, you've already got it inside you and it's already got easy access <laughs> to your internal organs and stuff like that. And you probably don't want to swallow any of these, but you definitely, uh, you know, truth be told, I guess you don't want to get hit with any of these. Uh, but if I had to choose one from the outside, go with the alpha. But if I got to choose an internal poison, he's not a good choice either. None of them are really good choices at that point. So... All right, so that's where we're gonna kind of leave off on these particles. Now we wanna talk about that nucleus again, and just keep in mind that your nucleus has got protons and neutrons in it with that electron cloud going around. And we're gonna forget about that electron cloud for much of the rest of this chapter. We're gonna focus on that nucleus. And sometimes we refer to protons and neutrons collectively as nucleons. Nucleons, anything that lives in the nucleus, i.e. protons or neutrons. All right. So if we look at the atomic number here, and let's take a look at a common isotope here. Here we're going to take a look at uranium-235, and if you look on the periodic table, he's atomic number 92. And I just want to remind you of what this symbol means. And again, the top number is the mass number, and it's the total number of protons and neutrons combined. And if you look again, protons have an atomic number of one, neutrons have an atomic number of one, and again... That's the only thing that lives in that nucleus. And so when you add up the total number of protons and neutrons, it's going to add up to a whole number that's the mass number of your specific isotope. And a reminder that there are different isotopes of different atoms, and it's just due to a different number of neutrons in the nucleus, and therefore a different mass for that nucleus as well. And so it turns out the, the radioactive, you know, I shouldn't say the radioactive one, the one that's good for nuclear reactions uh, in like nuclear reactors and stuff for uranium, that's uranium-235. The one that's not quite so radioactive and with a much longer half-life is uranium-238. And unfortunately, they come together as a pair. And so if you want that, if you want the good stuff here, you're going to have to separate them. And we do them based on their difference in weight and difference in density. And we do that with a, a, a differential centri uh, centrifuge. So differential centrifugation, we say, to kind of separate those. And this is the good stuff. Unfortunately, it is definitely by far the minor component. So... Uh, Lots of effort to purify this away from the uranium-238. So, all right, so here the 235, that's your protons and neutrons combined, but your atomic number is always equal to the number of protons in that nucleus. And so in this case, we can see that we're definitely going to have 92 protons. So, and if we want to figure out the number of neutrons, it's convenient if we write the symbol this way because you can just kind of make it a subtraction problem here and take the protons and neutrons combined, subtract off the number of protons, and in this case, you're going to get 143 neutrons. So, just want to remind you of how this works. Now, one thing to note, I want you to also distinguish between the mass number and the atomic mass. So, the atomic mass is kind of that... Uh, uh, more exact mass or average mass of all the naturally occurring isotopes uh, and things of this sort. Uh, and that atomic mass is what you see on the periodic table. Now, if you look on the periodic table, it's not 235 for uranium, but again, most uranium actually weighs 
uh, or is it, you know uranium 238 and by the time you get their exact masses for one and then average them out it's going to come out a lot closer to 238 than it is to 235. so the atomic mass on the periodic table doesn't correspond to any one specific isotope it's an average or a weighted average of all the naturally occurring isotopes so keep that in mind um, Cool. Also keep in mind that this uranium-235 doesn't weigh exactly 235. So because your protons and neutrons don't weigh exactly one. And there's really another part to that as well that we're not going to get into. But uh, And so this number is just a rounded whole number. If you said, well, what's the exact mass of a, a uranium-235 nucleus? Well, it's like 235.04 something something. You know, and we've got pretty exact numbers for what those weigh and stuff. And we'll, we'll use this towards the end of this uh, chapter in some calculations. All right, so I want to talk about one more thing. If you look at that uranium nucleus, again, made up of protons and neutrons, uh, if you think about it too, too hard here, you're going to come up with some difficulties. And one, those protons have a plus one charge. The neutrons are neutral. And so you can see a bunch of neutrons hanging out together. Not a problem. They're all neutral. But all the protons are plus one. And you know, if you have a proton here and a proton here, and they're both plus one charge, the closer you bring them together, the more they hate each other. You get a bigger repulsion between the two. And so we have a problem. Why are they all hanging out together in that nucleus if they're all repelled by each other? Well, this electromagnetic force, this repulsion, there must be something stronger holding them together in the nucleus. And they didn't get creative on the name of this force. They just called it the strong nuclear force. There you go. So again, not creative in the name, but it only operates at super tiny distances. So at any kind of normal distances, you know, out in space and stuff like that, uh, we don't really see a strong nuclear force. But at the super tiny distances that you see inside of a nucleus, it is a very strong force, stronger than the electromagnetic repulsion experienced by those protons, and it holds that nucleus together. So now that we've reviewed a lot of the major players in our nuclear reactions, so we want to take a look at the nuclear reactions themselves and learn how to balance them. And it turns out it's a very simple process. In balancing a nuclear reaction, you have to balance the mass numbers on both sides of your reaction arrow, and you have to balance the atomic numbers on both sides of the reaction arrow, and that's how it's going to play out. Now, in both these two, I'm going to have you balance these nuclear reactions and predict the identity of this mystery particle. So if we take a look at the first one here, we see that the mass number is 238 here on the left-hand side of the reaction arrow, the reactant side, and on the product side, we got 234. And so this mystery particle has to provide the difference, an additional four. So then if we look at the atomic numbers, we got 92 total on the reactant side, only 90 so far. So we're gonna need an additional two here. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, well, who's got an atomic number of two and a mass number of four? Well, that is your alpha particle. So, and that is our missing mystery particle here. Now, one thing to note, we also could have written this like so as well, because again, the alpha particle is the equivalent of a helium nucleus, and you'll see it written either way. All right, so let's do the same thing here in this next one that the mass numbers are already the same, 214, 214. So our mystery particle here on the reactant side must have a mass number of zero. So, but then we look at our atomic numbers, 83 on the reactant side, 82 on the product side. So what does this guy need to have to make them equal? Well, in this case, that's going to be negative one. And so what has an atomic number of negative one and a mass number of zero? That is your beta particle or electron. Again, this could have also been written like so. Either way, and we'll find out these get special names. When you have an alpha particle as a product, we'll end up calling that alpha decay, we'll learn in the next lesson. And when you've got an electron or beta particle as a reactant, we refer to this as an electron capture reaction, which we will also learn about in the next lesson as well. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on nuclear chemistry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.